Welcome one and all to the Storybox podcast, the place to be if you are a lover of stories. My name is Jay Phantom, former real estate agent now, living my purpose, sharing amazing stories from people all over the world. I'm grateful that you're here today. Now let's journey into the Storybox together and hear more about whose story will be unboxed today. Well, everyone, it is my absolute honor and pleasure to welcome Turia Pitt to the Storybox podcast today. Turia, at the age of 24, life, her life changed uh, in an instant. She is an ultra marathon runner from Australia. She is also a motivational speaker, a best selling author of multiple books. She's overcome overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly ex- extreme odds. You've been able to share the stage with the incredible Tony Robbins. You've achieved so much in your life. Turia, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to Storybox today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Jay. It's awesome to be here. Thank you so much for giving up your time and for being early. (laughs) I love it. Um, It's really an honor to have you here. Uh, You're someone that I have admired and and looked up to for quite some time, so I thought I'd just say that and and share it. Um, I remember seeing you on 60 Minutes uh, way back when and your incredible attitude towards life it really was an inspiration and I remember just like sitting there with my mom my mom was in tears and I have to be honest I shed, I shed a, a, a tear here and there <laughs> um, but what you've been able to achieve since that accident has just been absolutely incredible and even before the accident what you were achieving was incredible before we dive into your backstory and why you do what you do how you got started doing what you do now I have one question that I love asking people, which is, what does success look like to you? Look, I think success, it's going to be different for all of us. Like your idea of success, Jay, is going to be very different to to what I define to be successful. But for me, I think, you know, the broad strokes are that, you know, if we're spending time with people that we love and that make us feel good about being who we are, if we get to work on goals or projects that we find really meaningful. Um, I think if we can do both of those things, I think that paints a pretty good picture of success for most of us. But I also think part of success is understanding that, you know, not every day you're going to wake up feeling energized, not every day you're going to wake up feeling enthusiastic, excited, motivated. And so rather than focusing on, you know, always having these really positive emotions in our life or always wanting to be motivated by some external source, I just think to myself, like, all I've got to do is do one step today that's going to move me forward on my goals or what's one thing I could do great today or what's one thing I can be grateful for for today. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, I guess my approach is a little bit common sense, a little bit simple, but um, that's, I guess that's how I've done everything that I've done is just taking it one step at a time, one day at a time. I love that. I've got two questions coming from your answer, which the first one is where did you come up with your idea of success? Was it a gradual thing over time or was there some form of catalyst moment in your life somewhere? We'll go with that question first and I'll ask you the next one after. Yeah. Well, okay. So I came up with that idea because I was always getting asked what, what my idea of success was. So I thought oh, I better come up with a bloody good answer for this question because I get asked it a lot. Um, I think when I was younger, like when I was 18, for me, I thought a successful life was um, probably making a lot of money. That's part of the reason why I chose mining engineering because engineers get paid really well. Um, Making a lot of money and perhaps having a life that may have appeared good from the outside but might not have been that good on the inside. Having said that, I don't think I've ever been overly materialistic. Um, I, I come from a small coastal town on the south coast of New South Wales and I really, you know, it's, it's a shout out to my town really because I think it's it's a place that has kept me humble and grounded and, I mean, I still, I still live in the same place where I grow up as well right now and my partner, I went to school with my partner. Wow. Yeah, I know. Was Tragic it love at first sight? <laughs> <laughs> uh, was it love at first sight? I don't know. He was like my brother's friend. Mm. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's how all good relationships start, isn't it? As friends. Yeah, probably. But, yeah. So my, my question to you would be from that, 
what sort of motivates you, Turia, now? Like as opposed to before, has it changed for you over time, the things that motivate you? No, like when I was younger, I was motivated by money, by achieving really big goals um, and by creating a really great life for myself. And today the motivations, look, they're, they're pretty similar. Um, I'm probably not as motivated by money. I think now because I'm a bit older, I'm a bit more mature. It's been almost 10 years since the fire. I'm a mom. I've got two little boys. So I think really they're probably my main motivation is creating a really great life for them and bringing them up in a really stable environment and also teaching them about resilience and patience and all of these really great skills that we all really need. Mm. So I think now that would be my biggest motivator. But I want to temper that by saying, you know, I I don't want to have this image where people assume that I'm someone who's naturally motivated because I'm not. I'm, you know, some mornings I wake up, I'm tired, I'm stressed, I might be cranky. Um, so for me, I just focus on being consistent and I just ask myself like, what's one small step I could take today that's going to progress me on my goals. And that's, that's really it. I love that. I have a saying that I use quite often that I live by every single day, which is be persistent to remain consistent. Other things. Yeah. I love that. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Because for me, consistency is the flow on effect when I'm persistent because I, the way I think about it is I could be consistent in little things but if I give up if I'm not persistent at it then I won't be ever consistent really it's like constantly doing stuff and then when I am persistent I can push forward I can push through all the barriers all the hurt the pain you name it um so I thought I'd share that yeah yeah that's nice well I think yeah, I think it's kind of simple. Like if you apply yourself, if you put the work in, if you're persistent and you are consistent, then I think over time you will see results. And I think that's really key because I think a lot of people, when they try something new, whether that's a diet or like working on their body or writing a book or whatever it is, they might give up a little too early before they actually see results. Mm. That's what I've noticed as well in my life. It's like, it's a funny thing. Like every single time I want to give up, I tell myself, hey, you tell other people that you be persistent. So why are you stopping? <laughs> it's yeah, almost like yeah, that, yeah. That, uh, yeah. a person that keeps on digging, the two people that keep on digging for the diamond, one person gives up, but the one person that is actually persistent ends up reaching the diamond like he doesn't give up. And it's like yeah. that moment of realization when you have achieved something great in your life or what people perceive as great uh, is, is relative to that person. But if you have achieved greatness, you know, for you, like that is the ultimate level of satisfaction when you do achieve it. That's what, mm. I've, that's what I've experienced. I don't know about you, Turia. You've experienced the same. Yeah. Experience. I mean, like, I guess, well, you know, in the early days of being in hospital, I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk, I couldn't wipe my ass. And so it was very hard to feel like the athletic young woman who was competing in an ultra marathon. And I think what I did is I, I set goals to myself. And one of the goals I wanted to do was an Ironman. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know what an Ironman is, Jay, but it's, um, it's like the epitome of endurance events. It's a triathlon. Um, Crazy. <laughs> and I think, that, but I think that was really good too, because instead of my focus, instead of me ruminating on what had happened to me and obsessing about what had happened to me, I was able to put my energy and my time, and my focus and my commitment into achieving this really epic goal for myself. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think that's another thing too, like being able to change our focus. And, you know, when we're feeling down or when we're feeling sad, it's really easy to get stuck in our heads. Mm. But I think it's really awesome to get into the habit of changing our focus and asking ourselves, well, like what's one thing I can be grateful mm. for or what could I do right now that could help someone else? Mm. Um I guess that's that's what I've always done. And again, it sounds really simple. Like it sounds almost common sense, something like our grandmas would have told us. Um, but I think that, that that's the key. Like a lot of this stuff is simple. Mm. It's just about implementing it and making it become a habit. It's having a, a belief first or keep telling yourself and then making it a belief and then act, actually actioning it. I think like you're right, it is 100% simple. But it's easier to say something than actually do it. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. I like I'm not perfect. Like I 
you know, one of the things I do every morning is I, I practice gratitude for things in my life. I think of three things that I'm grateful for every morning. And this morning, like my partner left for work really early. Then I had to go fill the car up with petrol and I was just like really shitty. Mm. And I, then I thought, I oh, you haven't even practiced gratitude this morning, mate. Like I was just, you know, those mornings where you're just in a rush and you're trying to get things done and you end up being really annoyed. Yeah. And then like as soon as I started thinking about what I was grateful for, and mainly for me, it's my beautiful sons and, um, you know, this really awesome town where I live, straight away I just felt I felt better. I felt better about my day ahead and I felt more in control as well. Mm. So, yeah, I'm not... I'm not, I'm not a saint and I'm not, I'm not perfect at this stuff either, but I do make a genuine effort to try and do this stuff because I know it makes me feel happier, makes me feel in more control and it just makes me feel good about myself and my life in general. And I guess they're all the themes I talk about in my new book, Happy. So your book, Happy, we'll get to that in, in a moment because I, I am really looking forward to diving into that. You've written many other books too, which have actually been bestsellers, which is pretty incredible. Um, I want to take the audience back a little bit to when everything started for you. So you mentioned that uh, you wanted to be engineer, I believe, uh, growing yeah. up. Yeah. So, so why an engineer? Look, I was good. I wrote, you know, I'm a pretty practical and logical person. I wrote two lists, a list of the things that I was good at. So I was good at science and math. And the other list of things were things that I wanted from a job. So I wanted a job where I could travel, where I got good money, where I got to work in remote locations and mining engineering ticked both of those boxes. Wow. And then from school, so here's what I'm curious about. Where did the ultra marathon running come, come into play? Was you always into ultra marathon running or how did that begin? No, because I grew up on the coast. I was more of a surfer, but I always loved running and I've always been good at running. And so... Um, yeah, I think after I left school and I wasn't by the coast, I just started running more. Mm. So it was never, it, was, it wasn't like I was running really long distances when, when I was a kid, but I always did things like cross country and mm. stuff. And did you go to university to study as well to become a, an engineer oh. or how did that, sorry, my dog. No, that's all good. Um, yeah, I went to university. I went to the University of New South Wales in Sydney. I did a double degree in mining engineering and environmental science. And it's weird now because like, I'm obviously not an engineer anymore, but I really love the process of learning and of educating ourselves. And I think the skills I learned at uni are very transferable mm. to the life I have now. And I really believe like if we're not growing if we're not challenging ourselves if we're not learning anything then like by definition we are stagnating yeah. and so I think that idea of you know continually learning or continually making progress um that's something that I want to do for for my life yeah what's that old um saying I think it's when we stop learning we cease to exist uh something like that I, I remember reading it. Um, Never heard it, but it sounds it sounds great. It, it sounds good. It's very, it's very, very true because I know for me that when I stopped, like when I was coasting through life a little bit, yeah, and I was literally thrown on my ass, and it's like massive wake up call, right? And you're thinking, well, what, there's got to be something more to life than just being where I am and you're right it's learning it's growing it's, it's important. yeah what do you what do you mean Jay when you say you were thrown on your ass is that metaphorically or literally so I I've almost died three times um I don't right okay I didn't want to, ta- didn't want to take away from your story at all no, no 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 I love I love listening to other people's stories more recently in 2018 um I ended up getting meningitis meningococcal uh, right okay yeah, so I was blind for four days and during that period of time I was in sort of like this comfortable position. I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't doing any improvement. Right. It was just me being stuck. And that moment of realization being blind for four days, I was in a place where I was doing a lot of thinking and reevaluating yep. in my life. Yep. And I realized, hang on a minute, there's got to be something more to life than what I was actually doing, where I was. And I made a commitment to myself that after that, I was going to do whatever it takes 
to just improve every single day and one thing didn't matter what it was just one little thing yeah that's when I sort of did some reflection on the persistence because I had little yeah. moments in my life of just being persistent <laughs> yeah. so yeah. that's li- the literal I was thrown on my ass and said look you're not moving you're not growing I'm going life just happened and put me in a place where okay I need to start growing um yeah so oh that's interesting yeah thank you for sharing sharing a little bit of your story no you're more than welcome um I want to sort of take it back to yours a little bit um you're running this this ultra marathon race I believe Yep. And, Ultra yeah. marathon. So I was about a quarter of the way through the race, about 25 kilometers through the race. I was trapped by a fire with five other runners. So it wasn't just me. Mm. Um, got burnt to 65% of my body, got evacuated out of there. I think about four hours after, after the fire had passed through. Um, and that whole time I was just in a state of disbelief, shock. Couldn't really comprehend what had happened to me. My concept of time, you know, it had dilated and constricted because I wasn't really cognizant of my surroundings. Um, And then we got evacuated to hospital and then I woke up a month later in Concord Hospital and that's a hospital in Sydney. I I really think that was where the real work for me began because it was at that point you know, like I said, I was in a hospital bed. I couldn't walk. I couldn't talk. I couldn't roll over to my side. And for me, the enormity of what lay ahead of me, it just seems massive, Jay, because I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do all of these things. So the idea of, of getting my life back, of being able to walk again, run again, compete again, have a family with my partner, Michael, it was, you know, the gap between where I was and I guess where I wanted to be and what I wanted my life to look like, it was insurmountable. Mm. So I guess I, you know, in that hospital bed, I decided that all I could really focus on was taking my journey um, one step at a time. And that's, that's the attitude I've still taken with me today. And what, you know, like I was saying before, when I wake up in the morning, I don't think about these massive goals I have for myself or with Ironman, I didn't focus on, you know, doing a four kilometer swim and then riding 180 kilometers and then doing a marathon. I just focus on, okay, well, what's the training session I have to do today? Or, you know, what's that conversation I have to have with someone today to, to, you know, make progress on this goal? Or what chapter do I need to submit of my new book to make sure that I'm on, I'm on task or I'm on deadline to get it submitted in time? So that's, yeah, that's really how I've done, how I've done everything. And I think, before the accident, I was never really good at being mindful and being in the present moment. I spent a lot of the time thinking about the future. Um, and I think that's how we're wired. You know, that's our biology. That's, you know, we're, we are inherently supposed to be like that. But I think when you can stop that track and try and savor the present moment, try and look forward to each day, think of things that you're grateful for, for me, I noticed a real shift in my mindset when I started looking at my life more in those in those small little bits. Mm. You know, if anyone's going through something tough at the moment, you know, it can be really hard thinking about what approach you want to take or what it is that you want to do. And so I would just strongly suggest that if you're going through something tough, just accept it, acknowledge it, say to yourself, yeah, what I'm going through with right now is shit. That's fine. It's just an emotion. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the second bit of advice I'd say is to get some perspective. Um, I always find reading a really great, great way for me to get some perspective. I read Eddie Jacku's book, The Happiest Man on Earth. They can read some of my books. Um, they can watch movies like The Diving Bell and the Butterfly or The Untouchable. So I think really when you get a bit of perspective on your own life, um, that is really helpful as well. You can also get perspective by helping someone else, helping someone that's less fortunate than you. And the third bit of advice is if you're struggling with something at the moment, to see a professional because just like if our car is broken, we take it to a mechanic. If we want to get our eyebrows waxed, we go to a beautician. If we're struggling with something, we should see a professional, a counsellor, a psychologist, and there's some really awesome support services out there as well. So I kind of answered your question in a really long roundabout way, but I think I hope that does it for you, Jay. 
No, it, it really does. And I like how you made a, a comparison between someone else that actually did want to get closure. And I think yeah. is such a, an important thing for, for many people, especially. And yeah, for I sure. Like, totally. I like how you touched on the acceptance too. Yeah. When we talk yeah. about acceptance. It's sort of like we don't want to accept many times. Like I like how you pointed, like you could go back, you could try and get closure, but what would be really the point for you? And I think that for you is, is sort of, I could be wrong in saying this, but that could be your form of accepting. Like nothing is going to change the fact that you were there, no matter how, how hard you try. And, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's very true. Like I have this, um, this method that I call the CAP method. So CAP, so C stands for choice, A stands for acceptance, and P stands for persistence. So you're basically putting a cap on all the negative and making it go. Um, so basically what I, what I say is it's your choice to accept the current reality that you're in, no matter what, and you've got to be persistent in not going back to all the negative that keeps coming back up into your life. Um, mm. I thought I would share that too. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, I think like, you, you know, when people tell you like not to worry about things, yeah. if you're really stressed about something, they'll be like, oh, don't worry. And I, I don't really think that's helpful advice because if I said to you, Jay, don't think of a Tim Tam, the first thing you probably think of is a Tim Tam. So you can't, like our brain doesn't, we can't not think of things. So for me, I changed my focus so instead of, ruminating over what had happened to me and ruminating about that day, I instead put my focus and my attention and my commitment and my time, which are all very valuable resources that we have. I put all of that into rebuilding myself and getting myself ready to do, to do an Ironman. So that for me, that was my main focus and my main goal for, for a lot of years. Mm, you're a true inspiration to me, I just have to say. It's absolutely, oh, thank, thank you. It's absolutely yeah. incredible. So I like how you mentioned Eddie Jacku's book too, The Happiest Man in the World because yeah. on earth I should say sorry. But I've just started reading that book. <laughs> it's, Isn't uh, it good? Oh, like it's I mean, amazing. It's, yeah. Couldn't put it down. But let's talk about your book for a moment, your, your latest book called Happy. Why did you decide to write a book titled Happy? And then I have a very interesting question after that, which is what is the difference you think between happiness and joy? Yeah, so I'm going to answer your second question first. I don't really think there is a massive difference between happiness and joy. Um, I think we all know if we feel good about ourselves, if we're feeling happy, if we're feeling content, if we're excited, you know, all of those really positive emotions. And, all, you know, also I think we all know when we're not happy, if we're angry, if we're envious, if we're bitter, if we're jealous. We all, you know, we might not be able to articulate or distinguish exactly between those types of emotions. But, we, you know, we know if we feel good and we know if we, if we feel bad mm -hmm. to start with. So I think, uh, yeah, I don't have a, a strong definition for what, happiness is and what made me write the book it was just because I got I was getting asked by a lot of people all around the world via email and dms and, and you know that sort of thing how come I'm so happy and I think what they meant like how can you go through a catastrophic traumatic experience rebuild your life and come out the other side still being really happy and I also think that was interesting too so I started researching and I started writing and the end result is the book that you're talking about, Jay. And I don't actually think there's a better year for a book on happiness than 2020 because it's been, it's been a bit of a shit, shit fight of a year. Um, and I really wondered, like, I was like, I wonder if this book will be relevant anymore for people. But I actually think it's more relevant than ever because it's about, you know, not looking to those cataclysmic events to bring us joy like getting married or going to the south of France with Jay and Beyonce but more about finding happiness and contentment and joy in our everyday lives by savoring the time that we have by practicing gratitude by doing something kind for someone else by going for a walk along the beach so really just to strip it all back and and look at things again 
I'm, I'm sounding like a very simple person, but just taking the pressure off ourselves and trying to enjoy every day of our lives. I love that. If someone was to... Oh, oh sorry, you go, you go. My bad. But if someone was to pick up the book and they're not a, exactly the best kind of reader, they're sort of like skimming. And if you could recommend one particular chapter in the book that they start by reading if they don't want to read the whole thing, they just want to read one particular chapter and get the most out of it, what chapter would that be for you? Well, look, Jay, in the book I've included a summary on each chapter. It's called a TLDR, Internet Speak for Too Long, Didn't Read. So for people who don't want to read the whole book and highlight it and put sticky notes and post it all through it, there is a summary provided at the end of the, each chapter. But for me, the book starts with gratitude. And I think practicing gratitude for our own lives is probably the easiest way, the easiest way and the most effective way for us to get a little bit happier. And all it is is spending, you know, I think of three things in the morning that I'm genuinely grateful for, whether it's a kookaburra sitting on my balcony, whether it's my son's playing on the carpet, whether it's my cup of coffee that my partner made me, just really reflecting on those things, reflecting on what I have going for myself in my life and reflecting on what I'm grateful for. And what does that do? Well, it trains us to focus on the positives and that helps us to build a happier and more positive mindset. So if there was just one thing that people could take out of the book or just one tip that your listeners wanted to implement, it would be to take one minute every morning to think about what they're really grateful for in their life. And they'll feel better after they do it. They'll feel better straight away. I can't actually wait to begin the book. <laughs> I have my copy. Um, I just haven't started it yet. I probably should have started it before I spoke to you. But <laughs> um, I just wanted to really get your perspective on the book before I dived into it in the first place. I like going into interviews fresh, not really knowing anything, being curious. and one of the things that I'm, I'm curious about is was it hard for you to actually write this book or did it flow from you compared to other books? Uh, uh, look, again, I'm a really boring person who just, you know, I, you know, it wasn't like I stayed, you know, I was smoking cigars inside and then like frantically typing it out. Then I went <laughs> to my publisher's office and I said, here it is. I, you know, I, I wrote every single day for about half an hour to an hour and the end result is the book that you've got. So, again, I didn't rely on being motivated externally. I didn't rely on being inspired by a particular event or by someone. I just focused on being consistent. And every night I'd sit down at my computer when the kids were in bed and I would say to myself, you've got to write for 15 minutes, if you write more, good. If you don't, that's fine. And that's how I did it. That's mm. how I do everything. I just break it down into little chunks and then I just do them. I love that. That's kind of like what I do too. I'm in the yeah. process now of writing two books. I know I'm probably crazy. I'm trying yeah, to- a little bit, a little bit. Two books is, is nuts. The first book, I'm almost finished and because I really struggle with grammar. <laughs> so yeah. I'm constantly going back over everything and, and re-editing stuff. You know what? You should get a proofreader or a I copywriter should. Should. to help you with that. Yeah. Because I, really like, yeah. <laughs> I think, no, well, I think in life we're all good at different things and, you know, some things I'm not good at. I could do them, but it's probably going to take me 10 times as long yeah. to get it done. So I think for you, Jay, I'm going to recommend that you get a copywriter or um, a proofreader. I love that advice. I'll take it on board. If you know anyone, because yeah. I don't know anyone. <laughs> put pretty- it out there. Put it, on, put it on Facebook or put it out on social media. Love Say, that. hey, looking for someone who is good at copy or good at proofreading. I love it. Thank you so much. Yeah. I have, uh, <laughs> with, with the little bit of a um, time we have left, I have a couple more questions for you if you don't mind. This one what has been the worst piece of advice you've ever received from someone? I don't reckon I've had one. I don't think like, I don't think anyone's given me really, really bad advice. Cause I think like with any advice, 
someone only knows part of the story, right? They probably don't understand the full context. They're not in your shoes. So they don't, they might not understand what you're asking very clearly. And then they're just offering their advice and the responsibility is then on you whether or not you take it. So I don't really think I've ever had a bad bit of advice. I've had people tell me to that I should do things and then I've done them and then I might have lost money or wasted a lot of time or had to do things again. But, you know, I was one who listened to that person. So, yeah, I don't really think there's ever been any terrible pieces of advice. If you could ask for a miracle in your life right now, if something was just to miraculously happen, if you had that opportunity, what would you ask for? Uh Look, again, I'm going to be really boring. I'm going to say I don't believe in miracles. I'm not religious. I, I, you know, I'm from the school of you apply yourself, you put in the work, you put in the work consistently and then you'll get results. And I think success always looks like a giant cataclysmic miraculous event perhaps, but I think the reality is there's a lot of hard work and grind that goes on behind the scenes that maybe a lot of people, you know, aren't aware of or aren't cognizant of. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, I have to agree with you on that one. Um, two more questions for you, if you don't mind. Actually, the last one, I'll, I'll, I'll put in a quick one, quick third, if you don't mind. So this is my legacy question that I love asking people at the end. You've been able to reach the age of 100 and your friends have put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it. We'll just call it magic but they've been able to show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? You know what? I think if I had a birthday film, I'd love it to show me with my family, with my husband, my partner, my boys, my mom, my brothers, my friends, the people I love. I think more than anything, they're the people I'd want to see in in a movie about me and like photos of us in cool places doing cool things so like down the beach out bushwalking uh visiting the glaciers in new zealand um you know maybe me crossing a triathlon finishing line and all of my family and friends are there to support me i think that's what i'd want to see i love that this one um may be a hard one to answer we'll see how we go If you could ask a question to anyone alive or dead, who would it be, why, and what question would you ask them? Um, I'd ask Guy de Maupassant. He's a French short story writer. And I would just ask him, because I love writing and I love short stories, I would ask him, like, what his creative process was. Like, how did he manage to produce such, um, such great short stories? 